I'll just I'll, um, come to your questions about what disciplines could contribute. And um, it seems to me, I don't know whether within um, World Academy, Gary, there are even, you know, evolutionary biologists, but it seems to me that if we're looking at the global system, what we're talking about is how do you get cooperation? And you know, we've got all these problems, whether it's AI, whether it's climate change, whatever it is, they're all going to require cooperation. And, and the people who are the scientists of cooperation are the game theorists and the evolutionary biologists. Now, if those people know how cooperation actually occurs, they know why we're even here today. Um, because if, if cooperation had failed, we wouldn't even be here. You know, so that would be one or a couple of disciplines I would suggest that we, we may be trying to I think that's an important point because there's always this, this sort of uh, narrative of competitiveness and, you know, that we've had since 1980 basically non-stop and it's often forgotten that uh, everything we do is cooperation. Just a quick question. You, you speak of competing visions. Why don't you mention a consensual vision? At least we should attempt a consensual <laughs> division, and if we can't get it, then set out our competing visions. But consensus is the point of democracy, <laughs> is the end point of democracy. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I just didn't want to assume that. No, quite. We have a vision instantly, and we can't. Neither should you. <laughs> can, I just add, can I just add, actually, I've got a good connection with David Sloan Wilson, who is. Um, He's one of the, the, the main uh, evolutionary biologists uh, behind group selection theory, which, which a lot of this has to do with. Um, so that might be something we can talk about. Okay. Right. Thank you, Thomas, for this presentation. Now, I, I want to talk about this concept of illiberal democracy. I think this is misleading because the concept assumes that liberal democracy is normality, illiberal democracy is True. abnormality. Mm -hmm. So this is rather misleading. Yeah, exactly that's what I was trying to say, that yeah. Yeah. the pathologies of the current system may well be on account of too much liberty, <coughs> in terms of unrestrained capital. Uh, human the root of the problem is whether we consider democracy as a um, form of government or as a procedure, or whether we consider it as a value, as an ideal. This is, I think, the basis of the problem. Yesterday, if you remember, I made the point that democracy is um, moving from a sort of Rule by all. So it's a procedure. It's a form of government. It is the rule by people, by all, which assumes that every member of the all, every member of the all, has the right capability to no. rule. No, not at all. So no. this is significant. I think that's on the theoretical point level, maybe, but in practice, we have representation. In practice, in practice any adjective, power. in practice, any adjective you put before democracy, whether it's liberal democracy, social democracy, or radical democracy, or cosmopolitan democracy, we have these adjectives. Any adjective you put before democracy, I argue you move away from democracy. What about two adjectives? Yeah. What about two adjectives? You move further. No, you don't. You move, two <laughs> you move yeah, okay. further. Uh, we could discuss that for a long time. Yeah. As I said, that's a historical mm. philosophical point. Mm. I really want to focus on. Yeah, no, I'm going to. I'm going to complete Thomas. Yeah. Mm. So this is. Enough. This is, I think, this is liberal versus illiberal democracy dichotomy is misleading. False, yeah. And uh, with regard to your priorities and strategies, uh, I don't have any um, objections to them, but I am rather um, hesitant 
um, number four under strategies, exposing illiberal leaders' false claims and hidden agendas. I think this is dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody could come and this group discussing here, they have a hidden agenda. I think this is dangerous. And so I, I, I put my reservation on number four strategy. Okay, that's fair enough. Oh. Um, yesterday, uh, we were, um, it was demonstrated uh, by uh, PowerPoint, the EIU Democracy Index of 2017, which classified the world into full democracy or flawed democracy. Then we have hybrid regimes and authoritarian regimes, so it's a, quite a biased um, classification, I would say. So I bring in what you, the, the notion of hybrid is very important, I think, for our discussion. Uh, you mentioned hybrid solutions. I think there should also be hybrid democracy, because not regimes. Because we have many cases now of nation states that are uh, defending their sovereignty, um, liberating themselves from colonial rule, just establishing a system and figuring out what works with us, what works with our 70 uh, percentage poverty and, and the problems we have here and there and liberating yourself from um, the shackles of uh, economic control and globalization and so on. And they are seeking hybrid solutions. They don't talk about it because if they talk about it, the um, IMF and uh, the World Bank won't give them loans, as I said. So they say we're building a democracy, but they will be building hybrid democracies because just like uh, you don't have to be a communist, you can be an Arab socialist the way Nasser tried to introduce because there's so much poverty there. The problems are different from the problems of other countries. And so countries have different solutions and we should allow for that fluid flexibility. And then instead of throwing out democracy, we can say, <laughs> what about hybrid democracy as opposed to hybrid regimes, authoritarian regimes, which is bad, and then democracy can be full or flawed is very rigid. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Well, um, I'm glad you put the question of the Great Transformation there, because the Great Transformation is the title of a fantastic little book about um, industrialization in the 19th century, right? By by Karl Polanyi. And um, what we we watch in the Great Transformation of the 19th century is two things, it is a twofold uh, uh, motion uh, towards the building up of capitalism after the, the primitive accumulation of capital, and on the other hand, the construction of the nation state. And uh, in fact, after the 19th century, the 20th century, we have seen the co-evolution Right? the co-evolution of the nation-state and of capitalism. So, when talking about uh, illiberal democracies, we are talking about something which is a bit fuzzy, because uh, we are concentrating in one part of the equation, and we are forgetting the other one. We, we all talk about the economy and the liberal and so on and so forth, but we forget about the nation-state. Uh, is a nation state, is it necessary to transform the nation state? Or shall we keep it like this, you know, as it was constructed in the 19th century? Yeah. In his book, Zachariah makes the point that in the West, democratic institutions rose up in societies which had already accepted liberal cultural values, and by that, in the traditional definition of liberalism, freedom and social equality given prominence. It's not a, a, a comment on the actual way the government worked. It was a comment on 
the cultural values that believed and tried to affirm greater freedom for individuals and greater uh, equality under law. Uh, his comment was, his observation was, that the effort to extend democratic institutions from the European, country, European and North American countries from which it took root uh, often resulted in something other than what they thought they were propagating, where the institutions associated with electoral representative democracy were used to affirm other values which are not fundamentally falling in this category of liberal. Uh, there was the, he gave the example of Iran uh, essentially uh, becoming a theocratic uh, uh, society, uh, uh, using democracy to get elected. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, in a less extreme form, but what we see in India where democracy is used to elect people according to caste uh, who would like to give preference to their own uh, community. It's a widespread phenomenon. It has very many implications and applications. But the reason we put it in this agenda was not so much with reference to the obvious cases in the past where democracy has been used for other purposes, but the fact that we're seeing today uh, even those societies which regarded themselves as the home of liberal democracy, exhibiting some of the characteristics which we previously associated only uh, with societies that had other cultural origins. And the US, the, the disturbing trends we see in the US today being uh, uh, the case in point. And because there, as I travel around Europe, especially in Europe, but it's true in Korea, it's true almost everywhere I go, I see how disturbed people are uh, because this idea of what American or uh, English democracy we thought it was and what's manifesting there now, it seems to be a very serious uh, point to try to understand exactly what's going on, why this polarization uh, 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 and uh, uh, why the vulgarity uh, that was not previously associated, why the, the blatant use of uh, uh, falsehood in different forms is becoming so exaggerated, we just thought it needs to be on the agenda. That said, I think we shouldn't confuse it uh, with at least what I was trying to say about neoliberalism. I think it's true that they are related phenomenon in the sense that if money power comes to dominate over the political system, whether you call it plutocracy or oligarchy or state capture or whatever are the terms, you're definitely moving away from liberal democracy to an illiberal democracy. Uh, and and that, that may be the mm. same or a different conversation, but the liberalism there, it, it's, it's not the same word we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a neoliberal economic philosophy which essentially gives un, uh, unrestricted freedom for economic activity, and this is, we're talking about the liberalism of political and of social values, essentially, the rights of the individual uh, in society. So I I don't know if it clarified okay, I, anything. I think but it's quite clear. I think. I just want to briefly say that if you look at the statistics, we talk about transformation, whether it's water scarcity, whether it's climate change, it's pollution, it's land degradation, population cause, and they all look like this. All of them. They all look like this. Like, yeah. So the 19th, the 20th century is here. That's a massive change on the long view. But looking ahead, it's like, oh my God. That's what I mean by quantum transformation. The acceleration is so, so massive now in all those trends. That's what I'm mm -hmm. meant by. Then it occurred to me that when we began to look at the way in which the Republican Party functions, its effort 
for many years now to depreciate the vote by complex voting restrictions. Gerrymandering is almost an art form. Uh, and a huge amount of it has been on the side of illiberal democracy. Although they never say that, but that's where it is. So I, uh, 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 they haven't been honest about it, but in fact they have a very clear agenda as to what they should do. So we're not only dealing with how you improve democracies, how we salvage ourselves from these guys that are going after us, okay? That's what I think. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, Thomas, I would like, and uh, thank you for these questions. I would say they are very penetrating and uh, they touch the uh, core issues of the problem that we are, we are discussing today, starting yesterday. And I think that is very important because uh, taking now the speed of change and what you have shown, the singularity curve, uh, it shows that sometimes, or very soon, we will not have time to answer the question. So putting the questions is more important sometimes mm -hmm. than answering this question. So my congratulations. I would also uh, want to comment on uh, this uh, liberal, liberal, uh, and uh, thank you again for your verification of course I uh, totally agree with, with it. I think that illiberal democracy is just certain extent is a redemption for undemocratic liberalism that reigned in the world for many decades. And uh, uh, one of the problems with that, that uh, the values and principles of freedom have become overshadowed by the economic success. Because people were, uh, have started to measure the uh, extent of their freedom by the economic extent, uh, uh, economic uh, success, economic results. It's like, you know, in the United States, there is a fam famous question, show me your money. If you are talking about something, show me how you are successful. Show me your money. So, uh, and in fact, uh, that led to a very peculiar situation that people started to think about wealth, about economic success, as a guarantee for their freedom. And any attempt to undermine economic success, like talking about in any critical, is considered an attack on a freedom. And I think that that was the mechanism that led us where we are. And uh, in addition to that, unfortunately, as I s said somewhere earlier, the principles of democracy have been converted into the instruments of foreign policy, domestic policy. In foreign policy, there was, OK, we are exporting democracy, but we are doing for the sake of, the, of all the world. It was a, a missionary agenda of the United States, which, by the way, is not ideological. It is uh, prompted by the history of the United States. It is rooted in the genetic memory of the people of the United States. It is not something artificial for the US. But the results do not depend. It's like, you know, earthquake. Earthquake can be, you know, uh, um, uh, could happen because of the sea waves, peak waves, but the result is the same, what, what we, we can see. But anyway, I think that these uh, two uh, trends explain how we came to the illiberal democracy today. But then there is another question, which is very practical and very important that you've raised here. Whether, uh, uh, whether uh, an authoritarianism is a step to failing state. And uh, here I'm, I would be very cautious, because we have lots of examples that there is a possibility to move 
from authoritarian. Well, uh, let's look at uh, uh, a certain point uh, of uh, Singapore. It moved in this direction from authoritarian to democratic. Uh, of course, it's much more difficult to go up from the status of the failing state. It's clear. But again, what is the problem with that? I think the biggest problem, and that was also uh, raised in your uh, questionnaire, that uh, uh, authoritarian regime, what is bad about authoritarian regime? It's bad management. It's bad management. Under authoritarian regime, you could consolidate the resources of the nation very quickly for emergency situation. But on the longer perspective, you will always fail because there is no competitiveness and uh, there is no social power behind that. Yeah, I think that's a, the, the tag I was, yeah, yeah. The, the aspect I was thinking about. And bad management is, I think, a key problem. Mm -hmm. And even if at the beginning, I'm talking, you know, I'm half Russian, half Ukrainian, half Swiss, I have three halves. But anyway, uh, being half uh, Russian and half Ukrainian, I feel that I have the right to say a couple of words not only about Russia, but also about Ukraine. And I would say that for Ukraine, which has achieved, for instance, today, the rate of uh, corruption higher than in Russia today, according to the official statistics, and it's very close to this failing state situation. It's a very dangerous position for the country. And it's also the problem of bad management of today's Ukraine. If, if, if it was bad before the current regime, but unfortunately it didn't come better after the change at the end of the day. Yeah. So bad management is the core of the problem, which usually, if, if, if it is caught immediately, it would be converted back to the uh, dem de democracy, yeah. or it will go to. But it is the other thing, you know, what's what's the thing that's appealing in authoritarianism at this historic moment? And somewhere there, uh, people also looking for a strong state that takes charge, that actually manages well and runs a tight ship. Now, there is a desire for that, and indeed, there is a need. Yeah. I mean, if you look at consumer society today, we have to restrict our consumption. It's just not possible. Who's going to have, you know, how do you get the government that has the authority, legitimate authority to, to tell you, look, you cannot consume at the present rate? You know, uh, Lin Kuan Yu did it in Singapore. Gorbachev tried to do it in the Soviet Union. And there are several examples of this uh, uh, leadership, political leadership, which in some cases it was successful, in some not too much. But yeah, there are a couple are. of other people who want to say something. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Democracy, authoritarian. In Ukraine, we are now looking for, we don't have states, that's true. The Soviet Union collapsed, so Soviet system collapsed. So what about, how do we build up public service? Competent public stories. So there are so many, it's, it's now a discussion in our society. Look into Singapore, who is doing well, right? Or to um, Rwanda, they're also doing well, well economically. You know that all. And, but it's, it's uh, authoritarian regimes. So in the, my answer was all, always, look, guys, but we are, we are, we are society with different values. And we have great social power. That's why we had two revolution. Peaceful. Before Russia started to kill us, we were okay. We were peaceful. It was it just imagine you can't imagine how peaceful and how how I think, happy people were changing these regimes. But it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, unfortunately help us to build up competent public service. Uh, so in the long run, of course, we would be able to do it if not internal threats. And there is a huge internal, internal threat, threat because the other country neighbor, right, they, they do not have long-term perspective because they don't have social power. 
So how to, to get to the, like we are now in the middle of this you know, huge, huge problem. What is the way out for the world, but also for Ukraine? Well, because we're in the middle of this in a way, what I'm asking, what's our wish list? What are, you know, if we well, allow ourselves to dream for a moment, what would we ask for? What, what look, would be the requirements? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Thomas. We have been discussing your situation in Australia. Myself, I'm going to give an example. I was in Madagascar, I was in Tuzai Garden. The most beautiful country in the world, the most... <coughs> Why I was on the fl flight with, uh, with uh, some officers from big corporations? They don't care about their government, about their values, about their... Well, they are there to get their resources. So the corporate power is becoming really, you know, mm what Winston told about US. What Zakaria, I spoke to Zakaria, by the way, Gary, two years ago, before Trump became president. I was complaining, you know, just, look, what's going on in Ukraine? Well, I, you don't other, understand what's going on in the world. That, that's the other thing, that, 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 you know, we talked about the, the need for authority to make change, you know. What is authority? authority. What authority. authority. The other thing is also the nation, nationalism, the, the, the need behind that, call for more nationalism. I think it's that people also realize that you can't tame global capitalism. If it's not the nation states that do it, who's going to do it? So we really, in some way, do, do need kind of more sovereign, independent nation states. Otherwise, how can you have cooperation? You can only have cooperation between free individuals or free nations, you know, in a way. Anyway, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, coming back to liberal and illiberal, do you think of freedom and order as two extreme polarities? If you have complete freedom, you, you end up with a, a tyranny of the, the strong over the weak. If you have complete order, you have like fascism or totalitarianism. So we're looking at something in the middle as an optimum. And, <clears throat> um, that optimum, I would suggest, is, is, is achieved by a balance between governance and free market economics. You need both together, one to govern the other, but they both have to be on the same scale. The reason that things have become so liberal, as I, as I suggested in other sessions, is because the economy now works at the global level, but the governance is still stuck at the national level. And so anything that's global can outmaneuver that governance. It doesn't even have to, it's not even a question of, of vested interests in the traditional sense. It's, it's merely the unspoken reality that these interests can move elsewhere if a government tries to impose a policy that yeah. the, the, the capital doesn't like or that the markets don't like. And, and so there's a very su subtle subversion of democracy. So <clears throat> I think that's a global phenomenon. That's why we're seeing the rise of the far right. That's why we're seeing this retrenchment back to more authoritarian, nationalistic, yeah, yeah. take back control kind of thinking. And you know, that, that, that is um, to be expected. Yeah. But, at, but at the same time, we will need some kind of global cooperation if yeah. we're going to move forward again. Sure, yeah, but that institution building, who's going to drive it? That's the question. Well, I don't think it'll be the UN, and I, and I don't think it'll be nation states. It'll have to come from somewhere else, I think. Jerome, I think we skipped you, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, uh, uh, I will listen to him, but with the things, so, of course, I'd like to um, uh, I congratulate you about your, the picture you gave, which is very clear, it seems to me. But at the same time, uh, it's a problem with a good doctor uh, faced with cancer. Uh, and cancer has many symptoms, for example, heavy migraines. You see, a good doctor is not going to think he's going to solve the cancer issue by treating migraine or by using by a kind of uh, palliative treatment or you know, symptomatic treatment to be more correct. You must, uh, if you want to, to succeed, you must tackle with the heart, the core of the disease and the yes. cause, you see. And uh, of course, a major cause, which I'm uh, saying, as I said on the other sessions, 
when the major cause, you see, if the current present globalization in all its dimensions and aspects, in which, um, uh, so you cannot cure, I don't think that you can cure nationally uh, such and such a liberal uh, democracy, so called liberal democracy, because uh, anyway, it's going to be uh, uh, coming back again with a different uh, mask and multiply, like you see metastasis on the surface of the globe, and especially because of the, uh, of the terrible prospects, you see, of uh, uh, global issues ahead, you see, and with the, uh, uh, you, you go to the catast catastrophe. That's why I said, you see, that you need both to tackle the, the, the issues, both at the, if possible, at the global governance level, extremely difficult, it's not democratic, it's a question you see of favor and uh, suppose, uh, supposedly enlightened agreement between oligarchies, between major uh, states on the different kind of continents. You see, it will not be democratic, it will be a kind of real politic agreement. And, and I hope it will be forward looking to prevent, you see, the different scenario of a, of a new global war. There are different ones. So this is, uh, see, uh, and the second. But in that the second, do you think there is a place for science? Yes, of course. But the problem, see, I'm, I'm sorry to say that because see, I've been a long time an academic, and of course I, I've cooperated with many scientists in the world. I'm sorry to say that I think that scientists are very shy, or they are not accurate. You see, because. And uh, it's very a major problem because today the financing of science, you see, leads so many scientists across the world to be uh, very shy or silent or even complacent with uh, uh, the bad trends because they, they need funds. And so they, they behave in, uh, not in a very courageous and uh, forward looking manner. We just think about, you see, the funding their research. And uh, that's, a, that's a major topic because they are intelligent, their scientific capacity is not so much used to see to resolve the problem. And to resolve the problem, of course, there is a second item, which is to try to move forward new form, new forms of democracy, of forward looking democracy at the national especially at the national level. You see, and the, inter and the regional level is much more difficult because one of the, uh, uh, I will address that topic tomorrow, but the globalization is also weakening uh, tremendously the mechanism of regional cooperation. And the best example is the crisis of the European Union, of course. So that's, so that's not, and there's a third problem. There, uh, there's a sharp decline in the capacity of foresight in the world today, except in one sphere, but which is not open for the public, which is not in the public space, because more and more the capacities of foresight are between the hands of major states and within the military and the special or intelligence services. They concentrate that. Foresight has nearly disappeared in, for example, in the intergovernmental organization, and I'm very well placed for saying that, since because of my uh, you see my career, it disappeared within the European Union in all, nearly all the major ideals, foresight has disappeared. It disappeared also in most of the public sphere of national, of nation states or, or states. You see, so it disappeared. Of course, it still exists very much in transnational cooperation, but focused, of course, on the, uh, the goals you see, of transnational cooperation. So we need to, when I say we, we, the humans, everybody, all those who can, we need to redevelop new capacities of foresight. I don't know exactly where, it's difficult, difficult to say, but we need to think that it's not forcibly a lost battle, because Finland, for example, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, was in a terrible situation. It lost, you know, 35% of its trade was made with the Soviet Union, no, so it was a major crisis with uh, uh, unemployment rate with two figures. 
so long for a long time, and they decided to create an experience, unfortunately, who nearly finished today, but during eight or ten years, they, they, it was a government of four sides, built at the level of the prime minister, the parliament, the civil society, the transnational corporation, the local constituencies, and regional and cities cooperated to make foresight. And at this period of time, Finland went very well. But situations are fragile because now it's this time is over for Finland. They, they dropped foresight because of the electoral you see, uh, circumstances and so on. And uh, it's finished. But by the time they did that, Finland went out of the crisis and was one of the best examples in the world, not only for high technologies, we know, success of uh, at this period of time of Nokia, but with the education system, which is one of the three best systems in the world, and so on, and the society. So you know, there's no perfect democracy, but it was a good example of what could be a forward-looking democracy. And if we address the global issues of that, then we recreate the possible meaning of democracy. Because the democracy today has no longer meaning. It's so fragile, it's doomed. And it has no longer meaning, and it's pervaded with things which destroy necessarily. So we should address the topic, and we should address the issue of globalization, because if we don't address it, the, the, the other globalization of the end of the 19th century resulted in a world war. It was supposed to bring peace by finance. You know, this, it was a top, uh, globalization of finance, just quote, Polanyi, without saying, saying the great transformation and all that. He described that perfectly. So there was this wide globalization. Those who were the major actors were thinking that it would bring peace, and it resulted in a world war, terrible world war, in the destruction of democracy, in the explosion of very violent nationalism, exactly the contrary. And you see, all the periods are different, but there are some, there are some structural items which we can uh, uh, we, you can uh, recognize in the present situation. Do you agree? And that, so what I propose concretely is that was is should work precisely on that agenda. Mm. You see, not to, to get lost in too many directions, you see. It's, because if not, we are going to, to it's, uh, it may be uh, quite uh, amusing, but we are going to, to, to get lost in a nice talk. Yes, yes, okay. Um, yes, in the back, you haven't said anything, so I'm going to do it first. It's been here, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, well, several issues, I mean, it's an interesting discussion. Uh, my colleague, uh, the beginning, uh, I'm at the, in Europe, uh, raised the important issue. Whenever we add an adjective to democracy, it might be misleading. I have a very bad memory uh, living 40 years under communist rules when we were talking we should be proud of our socialist democracy. It meant no democracy, period. I mean, that is you remember the famous Habermans, you know, analysis with to change the institutions, you know, the awards are the really opposite meaning. <coughs> so, you know, we, it's, I understand that you use, Gary, this term of liberal democracy as a certain Western idea, you know, we were having, you know, as a dominant model. Yes, uh, democracy is the, the process. And um, uh, if uh, we expected that after 45 years or 75, <laughs> so Soviet Union, uh, the democratic uh, institutions were emerged strong and people will make immediately commitment. This is wrong. I mean, there are some elites were ready to go. But I think that uh, we did not and evaluate enough, we underestimated the damage done by the previous, by the communist system in the culture, in the mentality, in ethics. We are still, you know, facing this problem. Mm -hmm. 
So Natalia raised the issue of culture, you know, because I mean, in previous discussion, if we have the right culture in business, among business, we wouldn't need so many regulations because they would feel free and responsive. They will take uh, uh, care for the results of the activities, period. We don't have this. And this is also the, the one of the direction we need to talk, you know. Not only to influence the behavior of the economic power from outside, but from inside. Internalize value, internalize culture of responsibility and accountability is the way. So we are still in the wrong way in Central Eastern Europe to, to, to have the, the strong understanding and commitment to, to, uh, to the, the, the values. But looking at Ukraine, you know, look, you know, don't show me another country in which people died for European value, for Europe. There is no other country. This is for, I, for that reason I cannot agree with, with Alexander, you know, that Ukraine is the failed state. Ukraine is as, as the other, you know, we can mention, I mean, we can talk the same with Russia about, uh, about Poland, you know, and they, you know, uh, dissolved the uh, court of, uh, you know, uh, what the uh, constitutional court, you know, I mean, they don't have any supervision of the government, you know. So, I mean, the, the, the violation of basic rules of law, you know. So, I mean, uh, in Hungary, another example, you know, so what's going on in Slovakia. I mean, we have many countries with uh, similar problems, you know. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, outside of this. Let's, let's keep stay even different. So the, the cultural change, takes time. If we uh, want to have democracy deeply rooted, we need to start with the education from the very beginning, from the school. So anyway, and then what also we need to keep in mind, and then this is, is voting free election is just the first step. But we did not at the look, you know, we can evaluate also failed or successful state. How did they create the public service court? Do they have independence from the political party? Because this is the, the, the power also, the administrative power, which keep the uh, country on the track, on the laws and so every day. They didn't have time. <coughs> the, countries, the political parties came, dissolve all this, make their own political appointees. You know. And it's happening in uh, many countries in Central Eastern Europe. You know. So it's another reality. We okay. should not focus only on, on election and so the, the participation, supervised accountability, transparency, and so on. We have so many things to, to focus on. And then, you know, if you are talking about the way face, then we need to have create criteria. We probably would find uh, 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 more of this. My only concern was that pre ex-president, thanks God, George W. Bush used the term face state as a pretext for intervention in Iraq. And uh, this is what it sounds for me, you know, type of word. Yeah. So this is what I just wanted to raise, you know, and then uh, to create criteria. And we should look, you know, from the process of developing democracy, emerging institutions, to avoid happening. And this is also the situation we need to uh, talk. Uh, uh, what is the, uh, if we, Democrat uh, committed to certain should, uh, uh, values. Should we look, you know, uh, uh, what's going on when people are killing each other, like in Rwanda or you know, celebrating uh, and so you know, you know, so this is not our deal. Very, very Thank you very much. I want to support this big on uh, many issues that uh, you know, said, and I even want to. Uh, specify it. I think that in, in the country you mentioned Eastern Europe, Soviet former Soviet Union, 
The problem was that the economic development with a following, unsuing consumerism was much faster than the building of the democratic institutions of, in all these countries. And that created what it has created. Very rich discussion. Uh, and I think uh, it illustrates not just this session, but the other sessions as well. <coughs> Nominally, many would have thought that this meeting was a meeting about political science. Mm. But it's hard to find anything that this meeting is not about in terms of discipline. And I'm only raising that from the point of view of your question but that we haven't really answered. Uh, and that was about uh, what, was discipline. Uh, what disciplines can contribute and how can we integrate across disciplines. And uh, I think it's obvious that this group, which has very rich experience from many disciplines, are all contributing val uh, valuable uh, inputs to it. But the, the point I wanted to make is I don't think we have, I don't think the discipline we really need exists today. I think we're all talking about aspects of a discipline which has not been made because we divide reality by functional element of political science or sociology or psychology or economics. And the second meeting that the academy had here now four years ago plus, was on a very ambitious, under a very ambitious title of Towards an Integrated Science of Society. Uh, I would call it not an interdisciplinary subject, but something transdisciplinary. And what I mean is not we put the pieces together of something, but we look at something that's common to all the disciplines. Mm -hmm. And we have elements such as social power which maybe this is the first time we really have talked about social power as if it's not all political. It is, it's, I mean, everybody's understood it's in all aspects. And I think if we look at all the different dimensions of our discussion, values, leadership, uh, the relationship between the individual and the collective, the role of organization and management, uh, systems and complexity, uh, social process, what Alberto talked about, the conversion of social energy into capacity and results, uh, the social and psychological construction of knowledge. These don't belong to any discipline. This belong, these are fundamental properties of society. And uh, that was one of the things we've been talking about for years. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to see come out of this is a recognition that not only do we need to broaden and talk more to each other across disciplines, but we need to be thinking about how to evolve something that covers the, the foundations for all that we see on the surface. Uh, uh, I just get less than 60 seconds, so very briefly. Uh, we've canvassed a wide uh, range of matters, loosely under the label culture, uh, some of them are supremely uh, pessimistic uh, and some give us glimmers of optimism. Uh, I think that we have to look at the consequence of what we may eventually come up with and there were some ideas that came out here that I thought maybe we should stress. One is that fundamental to democracy is the notion of hope. If you extinguish democracy, you ex extinguish hope. So we have to have some component of it that establishes the notion that democracy represents an ideal of, of a hopeful future. The second idea that I thought was very fascinating, and I would like to, us to see if we can develop that further, is the foresight idea. The gentleman from France gave us this idea that the Finnish had been able to organize their own democracy with foresight to make it more successful. We have to see what we can tease out from this vast uh, discourse to, to generate some very realistic scenarios of foresight at a global level, okay? 
That's all I have to say. Thank you. Sorry for I see a little bit over time. I'm going to hand over to Gary, who's just. Uh,